The way that macOS handles memory is often misunderstood, especially in the Apple Silicon era. If you ever wanted to learn how macOS manages memory or need a refresher, this video's for you. Two quick things before I get started. Yeah, I'm dressed like I'm outside. That's because it's really cold out and I have to turn off the heating equipment while I record so you don't hear the sounds of the fans and whatnot. The other is, yeah, I have a nick on my nose, so you're gonna just have to deal with that. When Apple Silicon first launched, you'd hear goofy things like, eight gigabytes of RAM on Apple Silicon is like having 16 gigabytes of RAM on an Intel Mac. Well, today, most users recognize that eight gigabytes of RAM is not 16 gigabytes of RAM, regardless of the system architecture. What makes eight gigabytes of RAM still usable in 2024, even if not ideal, is the memory management in Mac OS. This will be a high-level overview of how your Mac manages memory, so you can better understand your own Mac. First, we're going to launch the Activity Monitor in Mac OS, and then click the Memory tab. You'll see a list of applications and processes on your computer that is actively running. To directly quote Apple, the memory pane displays how much memory your Mac is using, how often it's swapping memory between RAM and your startup disk, and how much of the memory is provided for an app and how much of it is being compressed. I'll revisit these concepts in a moment, but the most important thing to understand is the memory pressure graph at its most basic. Green means your Mac is using memory efficiently. Yellow means you may need to free up more RAM as you're starting to experience reduced performance. And red means the computer needs more RAM as you are experiencing performance reductions. In that last clip, you probably noticed I used a screenshot for red memory pressure. And that's for a reason, because I have a 12 inch MacBook that I use to capture the screen on, and it only has eight gigabytes of RAM. As much as I kept trying to open up applications and open up documents, Mac OS kept in the background managing the memory too quickly to put my memory pressure into the red range. So if anything, that's a testament to how good modern Mac OS is with RAM management. Freeing up RAM is generally accomplished by quitting applications and processes or by rebooting. To the right of memory pressure are two columns, which are the overview of your Mac's memory usage. Starting with the first column, physical memory is how much RAM your system has installed. Sadly, Apple Silicon infamously cannot be upgraded, at least not without using extreme hardware hacks. If you have a 16 gigabyte Apple Silicon Mac, it will forever have 16 gigabytes of physical memory. Memory use is how much RAM is being used, which is broken out into the right column, but let's first finish this center column. Cached files are files that are stored in the unused memory to improve performance. With modern Mac OS, unused RAM is wasted RAM. Therefore, it's uncommon to see Mac OS with a lot of free RAM. This is important. Longtime Mac users may remember checking for the amount of unused memory to gauge system performance. This no longer applies to Mac OS. Finally, we have swap use. This is the amount of space used on your startup drive to write memory page outs to disk. This functions as a memory extension. When the physical RAM is fully utilized, the operating system will move less frequently accessed data into temporary files onto the SSD. Um, this is an editor's note I realized while editing this. Swap space is the portion of the startup drive that's used for additional memory or virtual memory. I think we're good, let's resume. Mac OS uses virtual memory management where each application thinks it has access to a large contiguous block of memory. In reality, this can consist of both physical memory and swap space. It is dynamically managed by the operating system. The less physical RAM your computer has, the more likely it will make use of swap space. Modern SSDs are pretty fast, and this is likely one of the reasons why Apple Silicon feels zippy even when it's RAM start due to the low latency modern SSDs. Swap space can put wear and tear on SSDs though. Apple gets a lot of well-deserved criticism for still selling RAM-starved computers with small SSDs that aren't user serviceable. SSD memory cells have a finite amount of times that they can be rewritten over. Thus they employ techniques like wear leveling to spread out the usage and they can retire worn out memory cells. For many users, this will never be a problem, but there have been instances of SSDs being ravaged by memory swaps. It's absurd that the most likely component to die isn't user serviceable, and unfortunately, the answer is to pay Apple more money for a better configuration. Anyhow, in the right column, we have memory used. App memory is the amount of memory being used by apps. <laughs> Simple, right? 
Wired memory is the memory required by the operating system to operate. This memory cannot be cached and must stay in active RAM. Compressed RAM is RAM that has been compressed using virtual memory compression. This is a feature that was introduced a decade ago in 10.9 Mavericks. When your computer needs more RAM, it'll compress inactive processes and apps to make more RAM available. This feature is particularly a big deal. Virtual memory compression functions by using lossless data compression for anything memory related, such as RAM, virtual disk swaps, and save states. This has the benefit of speeding up swaps and improving battery life because you're less likely to need disk swaps as your RAM is being used more efficiently and virtual memory spaces require less disk space when written to a swap, thus reducing swap usage again. We can view which apps are using compressed memory by right clicking the main columns header and checking the compressed memory option. Another intelligent feature that's largely used for battery and performance is app napping. App napping works by detecting inactive applications and reducing its priority to reduce the amount of resources it consumes. If an app isn't visible to the user, isn't playing audio or performing a service like downloading a file in the background, it can be put to sleep. This has memory implications as napped applications are often prioritized for memory swaps and memory compression. If we go to the CPU section in the activity monitor, we can add the column app nap to see which applications are actively in a nap state. Another piece of wizardry that macOS implies is application save states. These are snapshots of the application's current state. This isn't explicitly a memory feature, but it does mean an application that supports save states can be quit, which frees up memory, then relaunch to the same state as it was before, like quitting Final Cut Pro and having it resume to the exact same place you were before you quit. This is an outgrowth of the path Apple laid with automatic termination and sudden termination in macOS. 10.7 Lion introduced a new way for developers to quit an app. Prior applications were terminated when a user selected the quit menu, but for applications that support automatic termination, the OS can decide to quit said application to free up resources. This is getting a bit geeky, but this was also expanded into XPC services. These are lightweight helper tools for applications. An application can use the XPC API to perform a task, and these helpers can be set to automatically terminate by the OS as needed. This again gives the OS more flexibility for resource management for applications that support these features. What I'm trying to say is that macOS has quite a few tools and options for intelligent resource management. On the hardware side, Apple Silicon uses unified memory for its CPU and GPU. On Intel Macs with integrated Intel GPUs, the integrated GPU would allocate a partition of RAM from the system memory for the GPU to use as video RAM, aka VRAM. Intel Macs with dedicated GPUs have their own physical VRAM on the GPU. Apple Silicon is uh, different. It uses unified memory, a term you've probably heard before, and that the unified memory was popularized in video game consoles. It's more efficient as the CPU and GPU can access the same memory block. This eliminates copy buffers and results in less memory usage and redundancy, thus less latency. Compared to the Intel integrated GPUs, this is a massive improvement as VRAM doesn't really exist as there's not a separate memory pool. The downside is when compared against a dedicated GPU is the RAM pulls double duty as video operations are now in the RAM. In systems with a large amount of RAM like a Mac Studio or Mac Pro, this can be a potential advantage as there's a much larger pool of memory that can be allocated to the GPU more than even the best dedicated GPUs offer. Also, unified memory can lower power consumption as it eliminates the need for another physical component. The downside is Apple ships some severely RAM-starved computer configurations. Modern dedicated GPUs often have more VRAM than Apple offers in total system memory in its lower-end configurations, and VRAM is also optimized for the sort of parallel computing operations that GPUs perform. Unified memory is especially beneficial in laptop configurations where in the past, Apple relied on Intel integrated GPUs or a combination of Intel integrated GPUs and a more power-hungry dedicated GPU. Apple's GPUs are unquestionably faster than Intel's iGPUs, and eliminating hardware redundancy allows for thinner, lighter, power-efficient laptops. On the desktop side of things, not having dedicated GPUs means not having access to the highest-end GPUs. 
macOS offers command line utilities built into the OS. Some of these utilities specifically pertain to macOS memory management. So if we go to our terminal, we can type in vm underscore stat. I'm not going to dive into these stats deeply, but just don't be alarmed when you see translation faults, as this is a normal function of virtual memory allocation. The basic concept is in a paging system, the physical RAM is divided into small, fixed size blocks called pages. The virtual memory, which is the space on the SSD acting as an extension of the RAM, is also divided into blocks of the same exact size, known as page frames. <laughs> it only took me nine minutes to explain what virtual memory is, but I had to get there first. The thing to understand is virtual memory isn't inherently negative. In fact, it's a more efficient system, especially in the era of SSDs. More RAM generally equates to more power draw as you have to add more DIMMs and more memory cells. The storing memory fragments on disk can be more efficient. SSDs are the special sauce that makes virtual memory more viable than it was in the past. SSDs have much faster transfer speeds than their hard disk predecessors, but more importantly, they have much less latency and much faster random reads and writes. Memory pages are small data blocks, thus the latency and random read and write performance is more important than overall continuous transfer speeds. SSDs can make virtual memory operations negligible and unnoticed by users. As previously mentioned, the problem arises when the system must overuse virtual memory to compensate for a lack of physical memory. Speed penalties can occur when the system constantly swaps data between the physical RAM and the SSD. As fast as modern SSDs are, they have considerably less bandwidth than RAM. You might think adding massive amounts of RAM to a system would speed it up as macOS would aggressively cache files to the RAM, as free memory is wasted memory. However, there comes a point when macOS can no longer creatively make use of a large memory pool. My Mac Pro 2019 has 160 gigabytes of RAM currently installed, and despite having many applications running like Apple Motion, Final Cut Pro, Topaz Video AI, and Pixelmator Pro, it is only using 83 gigabytes of RAM and 19 gigabytes of cache files, and it's not compressing the RAM. That means that there's 58 gigabytes of RAM just sitting untouched and unused. There are use cases that could certainly make use of more RAM, but those are edge cases. I can run this exact same workflow on my M1 Max, which only has 32 gigabytes of RAM and it'll run fantastically smooth, as macOS will employ its many tricks to make more effective use of limited RAM. Now back to the terminal utilities. VMstat just gives us a peek behind the curtain of the memory paging system in macOS. Memory underscore pressure is another utility that gives us a deeper look at the memory pressure delivered in the pages format. This provides some of the same information as VM underscore stat, but a little more user friendly. Lastly, there's top, which is a famous activity monitor in the terminal, but I'd recommend using homebrew to install htop as it's more user friendly. HTOP is worthy of a video on its own, and even me as a developer, I barely touch it, as the activity monitor performs mostly the same function. Before I go, there's one thing that I know people are inevitably going to ask, and that is because it's one of the most common questions in all Macintosh user groups, and that is, how much RAM should I get for my brand new Apple Silicon Mac? And I wish I could just give you a straight answer. But I can't. That is just impossible for me to know. But what I can give you is some tips. Your RAM usage is determined by your workflow, your workload, and how you use your Mac. So I would suggest if you already own a Mac, we just covered how you can use memory pressure in Activity Monitor and use that to your advantage. Just hit it with your worst workload and see how your RAM is performing. If it's always in the low green, you probably don't need more RAM in your next computer. Now, if you're looking at one of those brand new 8 gigabyte of RAM Macs, I would just not buy one of those. These are computers that are designed to be good enough for today and nothing more. If you're looking at one of those computers, buy a used 8 gigabyte of RAM happy Mac. There's plenty of options already on the market and you'll save quite a bit of money. And then when the day comes that Everyone's running localized little AI buddies that help you lie on your taxes and cheat at homework and 
make illegal drugs or whatever you do with your little AI buddies or be your virtual girlfriend in this sad future we're about to enter, these things might run entirely locally on your machine and require quite a bit of RAM. And that could be pretty painful if you already have a computer that's low spec. So what I'm actually trying to say, jokes aside about AI buddies, is if you're buying for today, buy a computer that's not going to hurt as much when it comes to tomorrow and you need to upgrade because you find yourself in a position where you've taken on a new job or hobby that requires a computer application or workflow that needs more RAM. So those are my two suggestions. So thanks for watching.